All right, Dereja joins us now to discuss the Ethiopian constitution and the role it plays in conflict and peace in Ethiopia. Dereja, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for inviting me. Excited my, to be here. My pleasure. This is a hot topic, uh, especially in the midst of this war, but it's been an ongoing conversation uh, in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian constitution was established in 1994, and in its establishment, it says, it created a federal and democratic state structure, but many argue it doesn't create either one of those. Can you yes. So when you think of uh, federalism, you uh, think of local rule. And the whole concept of federalism is to distribute power uh, from bottom up and make sure that the central government doesn't control every aspect of life. Uh, at the periphery. So when you have states that uh, in a federal system, they will have their own constitution. Uh, you will have a federal law and a federal constitution that pretty much provides the basic minimum guaranteed rights individuals have and also um, delineates power of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the individual. And then you have states that control certain aspects of uh, people's lives in education, healthcare, and uh, some cultural issues and stuff like that. But even within the, that system, within the states, you have local rule uh, at uh, city, county, and different levels. In the Ethiopian context, what we had was, um, a pseudo federal system, a federal system in name only, where the central government that was controlled by uh, one party, um, which had, uh, which created a coalition from different uh, other parties, but essentially controls what those parties do. Uh, that party was able to create uh, a system whereby it assigns different parties to rule over certain areas, uh, each state and they operate sort of as a client government for that uh, party. So uh, what I'm saying is the TPLF that controlled the Ethiopian government for about 20 years um, had these other parties, uh, the Oromo, Amhara, and Southern Peoples, and Afa, different parties that were assigned to rule over uh, different states uh, with the um, permission ac and acquiescence of the TPLF leaders. And if they actually don't follow what they're told, they would be replaced. So you don't have a federal system per se. You had one party controlling the, the entire country. In addition, their states are supposed to have their own constitution. But if you look at the Ethiopian uh, uh, system, each state has a, a constitution, but it's verbatim the same constitution that was written and given to them. The only difference between one state and another state is the name for Amhara is replaced with Tigray or Romo. And as you know, the federal system is, is, is an ethnic federal system where the country was divided at the time along nine ethnic federal states. And the dominant federal, the dominant ethnic group within each of those states was assigned to rule over those states. And in a country that has 80 different, uh, more than 80 different ethnic groups, it was neither an ethnic federalism or nor a federal system. Uh, when you talk about democracy, you're talking about elected government, and uh, we didn't have that either. The other interesting aspect is a lot of people debate about, you know, whether there's going to be, we should change the constitution or not, uh, whether there should be ethnic federalism or federalism or unitary system. And what I say to people is focus on the concept of distribution of power, distribution of power at the federal level between the executive, legislative and judicial judiciary but also within the states each at each level whether you're at uh, Kabele or zone or uh, you know 
district level, you need to have a system where people can elect their leaders at every stage. If you guarantee that kind of system in a country that has 80, 80 plus ethnic groups, you will have a truly democratic system, but you, you cannot rely on just creating one ethnic uh, uh, group uh, that is in power of this one state. And that ethnic group gets to say what happens within that entire region, whether you're in Romia or Tigray or Afar and you know Amhara, there are other groups that live in that in those regions. So you have to create a system where power just uh, is distributed throughout the country. So the question is not central ethnic federalism or whatever. It's let the people decide what they want at every stage of the uh, every 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 stage of government. And government is not just federal and state. It's local, it's cities, it's counties, it's you know zones. So let them have their own elected uh, officials. Let them decide how they educate their, ch their children, how they promote their culture. And you may have three or five different uh, educational uh, priorities. And you may have a uniform standard. That's fine. But each area can have, can tweak their education system. But make sure that they don't violate the federal constitution, the minimum rights people have, people who may be different uh, from others in that, in that area. Their federal rights need to be protected. And what the whole concept is states can give more rights, but cannot give less rights than the federal system. But they can have more rights. They can say, in this area, you have more protection from our police than the federal government gives you. You can do that. You can't just, you can't, but what you cannot do is to say you have less rights because we want to have, uh, we want to we wanna live this way, we want to do things this way, and we don't like what the federal government says, and therefore you're going to abide by our rule. That's not going to happen in a federal system. So the federal law has to be supreme law of the land. People need to be empowered to elect their leaders at all levels. And this whole idea of one ethnic group controlling the entire region, that's, not, that's inconsistent with the concept of federalism, inconsistent with the concept of democracy. So that's what we need, really, really we should talk about. Whether you want your kid to be raised in one little area, uh, go to school there, get married there, get old there and die there. And the minute they decide to venture off and go to another region, they have less rights. They cannot do this, they cannot do that. Uh, because they're not from that area. If you want that kind of system, you design a different rule and a different legal structure. But if you want a system where people have equality, democratic rights, freedom, wherever they go, and those rights are not checked off at the border of every state, and um, they travel with them, then you design a different system. So that's really the discussion that's where that's what has to be the discussion, not whether we want this, you want that, ethnic federalism and central, because we never had democracy, we never had a true federal system. Let's not kid ourselves. We're gonna have to start from new. In these ethnic federal states, it essentially is implying that in Oromia, ethnic Oromos can have more rights than any other ethnicity because this is their region when a lot of ethnic amharas live there in the amhara region it implies that uh ethnic amharas have more rights than uh oromos or any other ethnicity in that region is that the source i mean this is what people say all the time right is that the source of a lot of the ethnic conflict that we're seeing in many of the regions so it's a byproduct of a system uh, where you create a, a region based on ethnic group and say this region belongs to these people if you look at the constitution of these states they actually wrote this land is the 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 uh, 
is owned by these people, right? As if those are the only people who live in that land. So uh, it's a byproduct of a mentality that a land belongs to this group and that group, right? Land belongs to whoever lives in that land. Ethiopia belongs to all Ethiopians, right? So that's the whole concept of being a citizen of a nation. When you're a citizen of a nation, you can go anywhere you want. You don't need a passport within that nation. You have the same right as anyone else. Now, there's certain privileges that you get from being a resident of an area. But once you become a resident, you acquire those things. No one is going to tell you, for example, you can't have a driver's license in California or Virginia, so long as you live there. Maybe if you don't live there, they're not going to give you a driver's license because driving in, that, in those places is not a right. It's a privilege. But you have, but they cannot tell you, you don't have a right to remain silent when a police talks, police officer talks to you, because that's your constitutional right. They cannot take certain rights away from you that you get from the federal constitution, right? The American constitution doesn't tell you you have a right to drive a car. Okay, you don't have that right. The states would say you can drive a car if you're licensed then they have their rules, you abide by them. But they can't tell you, if you're from, uh, if you're black, you can't drive in California. Well, that's a problem. And if you're Mexican descent, you can't drive in Colorado. That's a problem. That's what, that's when you go to court and say, this law violates my federal constitutional right. And then that law becomes invalid. So, but if you, if you divide the United States in different parts and say, this land belongs to Irish Americans, this land belongs to German Americans, this land belongs to Mexican Americans, and you allow those groups to create a party to rule those areas, what do you think is going to happen? A byproduct of that is whoever else is not those people who live in that area, is going to get shafted. It's going to it's going to suffer discrimination. So um, I think what we now see in in Ethiopia, something that did not exist before, is the sense that certain people should leave certain areas. No one ever said that before. No one ever says you don't belong here. You need to leave this area. What is that? Where is that coming from? That comes from this concept of this land is so-and-so's land, this region is so-and-so's region. But in reality, people have been moving all over the world, all over the country. Ethnic groups have moved about, the Romos have moved from uh, south to north, the Amharas have moved from north to south. Everyone has been moving everywhere, getting married, intermarriage, intermingling, and it's hard to find a place that is uh, completely homogeneous in any part in any part of the country. So we need a 21st century law that is consistent with the aspiration of a 21st century mentality and person. What we're trying to why we tried to create in the past 30 years is a 16th century uh, law that governs people in 21st century. So we need to move from this concept that we live in these fixed enclaves and we don't venture off. The funny part is you have these ethnic leaders who live in UK and the United States. Uh, they own homes. They have uh, their kids going to nice schools here and everywhere, but they, want people from one region to be kicked out and they want uh, Amharas to leave Oromo land, Oromos to leave Amhara land. But you know, 
Why, why are you in the UK to begin with? Right, or in the US where there's so much diversity. <laughs> I mean, it's, when you what just- What are you doing here? <laughs> the logic is just, it like, it leaves like really pretty quickly. This at the, the logic of ethnic federalism, it's like you yeah. can't, it doesn't stay consistent for long. I think it's always helpful to give examples of, you know, what if it was like this in the United States or in the UK, you know, that hypothetical uh, situation that you gave in terms of discrimination of who can get a license and who can't based on race, which is, is unconstitutional here based on the federal constitution. I mean, that's essentially what's been happening in Ethiopia for a long time. We've seen it in Amhara and Oromoya uh, regions. Yeah. We've seen it in the Welkite corridor that TPLF annexed to be Tigray when it came into power. So then it was discriminating against ethnic Amharas there or people that they perceived to be ethnic Amharas. So is it fair and accurate to say that the current constitution in Ethiopia actually legalizes discrimination? Absolutely. Not only legalizes discrimination, it fosters discrimination. It, it, it promotes discrimination. And it promotes discrimination by its very structure. Right? When you have a country with 80 plus ethnic groups, but you have 11 states that are ruled by ethnic parties that control what happens in the entire state that they control, you're gonna have discrimination. So long as you are trying to do things based on ethnicity, you are going to have excluded and included people. And the excluded people are going to be left out. And the name itself, Kalit, meaning exclusionary zone, right? So it is, the states are known as Kalits. That means this is an exclusionary zone. This is my zone, you don't belong here. And that kind of mentality feeds into, for example, this whole notion that Addis Ababa belongs to this ethnic group or that ethnic group. Why does a city belong to an ethnic group? What is, where, where does this concept come from that uh, an area belongs to an ethnic group? What does it mean to belong to an ethnic group? Does it mean every ethnic group member gets a piece of that property. Okay, so if I'm a Romo, I get to claim some part of Addis Ababa. I mean, what's my share? And where's that coming from? How about a different ethnic group who's been living in Addis Ababa for generations? So what, they don't have any say in that? They don't own that? They don't own the land they live, they've been living? So we need to, we need to really think and rethink this whole concept of ethnic group owning things. It's individuals who own things, right? It's individuals who have rights and individuals who can enforce their rights in the court system. And you, this whole concept of group rights is, is, is a means to, for a few people at the top, subjugate others. So, for example, in Tigray, you have TPLF and their leaders. They all talk about the rights of Tigrayans, but they throw Tigrayans in jail. They take all kinds of people from their families and, and send them to war. And if they don't, they send them to jail. They don't have any problem uh, killing any number of uh, Tigrayans because they supported the central government. They take them out and shoot them. Why? They do it in the name of promoting Tigrayans. So same thing the former dictator Mengistu did. In the name of the masses, he would kill 10,000 people. So uh, this whole concept that certain individuals are allowed to act on behalf of an entire ethnic group is ridiculous. You have to let people tell you what they want. Maybe they would disagree with you. Maybe this is not what they want. We don't. We don't we're in a, we live in a country where we don't do statistics. So there's no one knows what Oromos want. No one knows what Amharas want. It's not. I mean, who, is Amhara one person? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
I will tell you, half of my family are Amharas, they don't agree on anything. I mean, on one, one day they may agree on this, and I have also a whole family members who are Romans, they disagree all the time, you know? And this whole idea that Romans think this way, Amharas think this way, Romans want this, Amharas want this, come on. We need to start talking about what people want, what individual want, individuals want. And you know how you know that? Through democracy. Let them decide right. and pay right. you what they want. So um, again, the whole idea that you have an ethnic group that picks its leaders who will act on behalf of everyone in the entire region, that's a recipe for an ongoing and then ending conflict. We need to start empowering individuals to, to, to assert their rights, to protect their rights, to exercise their democratic rights, to protect their individual freedom. And if you do that for everyone, they will tell you what they want. They will decide, they will elect who they want. Then they will have a system that they like because it's built based on their decision as opposed to the leaders. Right, there's really no society without the individuals. I mean, this is, uh, I think, especially uh, embedded in Tigray where being an individual voice that goes against the grain is literally fatal if you're in that region. Um, and then if you're on the outside, it's just, you know, there's so much resistance to it. But I was talking to somebody from Tigray actually that's outside of the, the region recently and she made that point of why do they think that we are a group or a society if they don't allow individuals to have their own opinion i mean they're absolutely fascist in their response as a group and i guess that's something that's been uh cooked into uh, the society for a long time and you do see it in, in in other ethnic groups as well and then even the concept of ethnicity is so ambiguous sometimes you know if you're an Adi Saba and you speak Amara yeah, are you Amhara or like is it you know what I mean it's some people say I keep being told what ethnicity I am and I never identified as that you know uh, it's not like race here that's a little bit more clear but even with race here there's some uh vague element so but a lot of people would argue this constitution and the way it uh it, it defines and promotes certain ethnic groups is the source of our issue. So why does it still exist, right? Why, what, what will it take to change this constitution? And why do you think it hasn't already been reformed under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed? Yeah, so it's, that's a, a difficult conversation to have when you have all kinds of conflicts everywhere in the country, right? So one of the unfortunate things that happened in the past two years, is that there was so much optimism when Abi Ahmed came to power. As you remember, he got the Nobel Peace Prize and there was peace with Eritrea and things were going to improve. The country was going to focus on development and uh, progress. And then there's, there was this uh, conflict in Tigray. I, you know, it reminded me of, uh, if you remember when Obama got elected, and the Republicans say, I think it was Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader said, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure Barack Obama does not succeed and that he's going to be a one-term president. And I feel like a certain type of mentality prevailed within the TPLF leaders. They were hell-bent on making sure that um, Abi Ahmed did not succeed, that his Nobel Peace Prize would be tarnished and all that. Because they, even as he was getting that prize, they were saying all kinds of things to undermine that. But um, there was this cynical uh, attitude about this whole change. And they, they, they know now, they, now they know, I think the constitution is not going to serve them. But um, they use that as a wedge issue to say that changing the constitution would undermine all the progress ethnic groups have made in the past 30 years and would undermine the rights. Even when the TPLF leader, what's his name, the old guy, uh, 
Sibad Negga, when he got a, a captured, he said, don't let them change the constitution. So that was his, um, uh, the con consistent message is that they brought this ethnic federalism that liberated people and the debate is whether there's going to be one party rule, uh, which they call Adawi or central, uh, one, one government, uh, one central government versus federal system. But they forgot they never gave federal system. They never had a federal system. And, you know, people uh, are, in Ethiopia, these ethnic leaders bank on the fact that, or they hope, people would not think for themselves, right? So if you start thinking, you become immediately a threat. You have to repeat, regurgitate, and say what they tell you. And if you start saying, well, I think uh, you know what you're saying doesn't make sense. How about this? You immediately become a threat. The old, um, the late Mario Como, not this governor, but the one, his dad used to say, if two people agree all the time, one of them is not thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and what they like is everyone agreeing with them, right? So if you're uh, the Oromo leader, every Oromo has to agree with you. If they don't, if they don't agree with you, then it's because they're not too Oromo. They're Same a traitor thing. of their ethnicity or they're a banda. Yeah. I mean, it's literally in the yeah. language. Yeah. So this whole system is created um, with a false narrative. And they want to repeat that false narrative several times until people feel like, oh, your uh, freedom is threatened. But can you tell me... Um, if there's any single individual in any federal one of those states that would say to you, I feel completely free in my affairs from government intrusion. I feel like I have two democratic rights and I feel like I have equal rights wherever I go in Ethiopia. No one will say that. Why do we have a system where no one will say they're completely, they feel freedom that they're equal everywhere and they have two democratic rights. So I'm talking about democratic rights within the state and at the federal level. So if you can't have people say that, the problem is the law, it's the constitution, it's the legal system that does not allow you to say that. It's the legal system that did not allow for the creation of the tradition, the culture to flourish whereby people use the legal system to resolve their disputes. So if you go back to the basics, the purpose of the law is to resolve disputes. If you have conflict, if you have war, that's a failure of the system. The same thing happened in the US in the, during the Civil War. They, um, when Lincoln got elected, that's when the southern states, the ones who tried to secede, started the war by firing at Fort, at Fort Sumter. And when Lincoln got elected, he was an abolitionist. They knew what was coming, and they they did not they did not want to live under that system. They didn't go to court. They lost the uh, federal election, so they resorted to violence. After that, the system recognized that inability to resolve issues through the court system would lead to a war, would lead to a dispute. And, and we, in this country, managed to resolve a lot of problems through the courts. You have you know, the civil rights movement, you have um, uh, where you have, for example, separate but equal schools that was resolved through the courts with Brown versus Board of Education, right? Um, there were instances where the court system failed, but there were instances where the court system avoided conflict. During Trump recently, he sued so many times to overturn 
the constitution, the court system at least resolved that issue. There were still people who, who did not uh, subscribe to, uh, who, who did not like what the court decided, but there were very uh, few minority who showed up at the Capitol and started rioting. But if you think of it, let's say there was no court system that decided those issues. All the 70 million people plus who voted for Trump would have been aggrieved if they believed the election was stolen. And if you didn't have a court system, at least that convinced uh, overwhelming majority of those 70 million people to say, there's no shenanigan, maybe it's, you know, uh, we lost the election, um, they would, and they stayed home. Those people would have come out and there would have been more conflict. So Bush versus Gore, the same thing. There was a time where no one knew who was going to be president and the Supreme Court decided it was Bush. So everyone moved on. And if you didn't have that kind of independent system, if you had a democratic party that controlled Congress and that party decides who the president is, that you would have a problem, right? So the system gets tested constantly. And the way the system responds to these conflicts um, is determinative of how a country can move on without resorting to violence. You know, what's curious as far as it relates to the current conflict is, you know, TPLF went ahead with the September elections, the regional elections, saying that it was illegal or unconstitutional for the federal government to delay its elections because of COVID. Uh, and after they declared that a couple of months later, they went to war. So it was as if they were operating as if they still ran and dominated this federalist system. Can you talk about where they yeah, went so, wrong in terms of how to handle it and how the constitution may have actually, the, that they write, wrote may have backfired against them? Yeah, so when you talk about um, a claim that something is unconstitutional, such as the extension or the delay of uh, election, uh, which a decision that was made by the election board, um, election commission board. Um, what normally happens in a democratic system is when you claim someone, an entity uh, has taken a step or, or made a rule that's unconstitutional, you go to court. You go to court and you file a lawsuit and you ask the court to declare that action as unconstitutional. Uh, what is striking is TPLF, a party that actually wrote and enacted the constitution and created the legal system that, uh, that we still operate with in Ethiopia, did not avail itself of the law that it, it itself uh, wrote and did not avail itself of the legal system it itself created having declared the delay of the election is unconstitutional, um, it went ahead and uh, started a war. So it's curious why a party that created a legal system that wrote the laws would not avail itself of the same laws when that party claims to be aggrieved by, by an action of the government an agency. And the answer is, when they created the law, the Ethiopian constitution that is in effect now, they did not create it with the view uh, that one day they may be outside of the government and they may need the protection of the law. They created it in, to allow them to subjugate and rule um, the country and to uh, have it serve the party that's in power. So when they're out of power, what they realized was, um, you know, the constitution doesn't really serve them, doesn't serve minorities, doesn't serve a party that doesn't control the government. Because under the Ethiopian uh, legal structure, the party that is in power gets to control in most situations, the way it's uh, written now, 
gets to control all the branches of the government. And um, they did not create an independent judiciary. They did not create a constitutional court. They created an independent judiciary in name. They would say the judiciary is independent. But in reality, there is no Supreme Court that can declare an action unconstitutional. The constitutional interpretation power is given to the House of Federation. And the House of Federation is part of the parliament. And whoever controls um, the government will pretty much control what happens within the House of Federation. We have a Supreme Court in name, which may declare or pass some laws, not that, sorry, uh, render a judgment, but that judgment has to be ratified by the House of Federation. So the House of Federation would have 30 days to invalidate the Supreme Court's decision or approve it. So- And it has the final say. It has the final say. So if you sue the government, basically the government that you sue will have the final say whether your lawsuit is going to succeed or not. Under that framework, if you're outside of the government, it's really hard to uh, have the confidence of going to court to, to, to present a challenge. Now, how did TPLF do the, the, uh, get to uh, got to control the uh, decision of the House of Federation? When they came to power, they were very reluctant to give lawyers the right to declare laws unconstitutional because the lawyers were trained under the old system and they, most of the trained lawyers were not TPLF members. So they created a very uh, cynical system whereby the House of Federation decides constitutional issues, interpre interprets the constitution, but they also designed it in a way not to allow Amharas and Romus to have jointly a majority within the House of Federation. They organized it in a way that each ethnic group gets one vote. So the Southern people, because there are 56 different ethnic groups get 56 different votes, right? 56 votes. So you have Amhara and Romus combined, they have like 37 votes. TPLF, which controlled uh, the Tigrayan peoples, uh, uh, that whole region, uh, the region of Tigray gets about six. So with just the Southern people, they get, they get to control because you know it's easier to it's easy to convince one person at a time, right? So we have 56 other people with 56 votes. So they get to control what happens within the House of Federation. Even if the Oromos were and Amharas would constitute the overwhelming majority of the people in the group, even if they disagree with TPL. So within that system, they are able to control the parliament. The House of, which has the House People's Representative and House of Federation, they get to control the courts, and they get to control the executive branch because the same people come out, come out of the parliament. Which is why you can't have a democratic system where power is so concentrated in one party, and that party controls all the branches of government. That's why I say and I argue the legal system that we have is not designed to help us resolve problems. The legal system that we have is actually the reason why we are gonna have conflict in Ethiopia. Because you are always gonna have conflict, you are always gonna have disputes. And if you don't have a legal structure and the legal system and laws that allow people to get redress, at least to have a fair hearing and a fair shake, um, and they have the confidence that they can go to court and they may win or they may, not, they may, they may lose, but at least they will have a future. That system is not there. So, and the only way that's to guarantee that system is to create an independent constitutional court that, can, that has the power to uh, hear constitutional issues and render a final judgment. Not a judgment that would be approved by the people you sue, a judgment that would be up, that would be final upon decision. The constitution has to be a reflection of the dream of the people and has to be a reflection of the collective dream. So you have to think about what sort of country your grandchildren should live in. 
what kind of country do you want your great great grandchildren to live in 300 years from now right stop worrying about today in the future where do you want to see this country go and then work your way backwards um so how do we get there like i said earlier if you want your kid to be born in one small area and live there and marry there and go to school there and die there and never venture off, you will have one system. But if you want your kid and grandchildren and great grandchildren to move anywhere they want to and live in peace and, and with equal right wherever they go, you design a different system. So um, the laws that we've been enacting are very reactionary. It's literally designed to um, negate what just happened under the previous government. And you cancel all the laws and you write new laws that work for you. That's not really how you design a constitution. You also have to have everyone's input. So if we really start talking about the dream of people, how they want to live, how their grandchildren should live, I think you can agree on certain principles. And those are, in my mind, principles that everyone can agree on. Equality, democratic rights, individual freedom. No one dislikes these things. Everyone wants them. So they can be a starting point. You can also have group rights if you want, if that's what you, know, you value. But it has to be a group right, has to be a reflection of the individuals within that group too. So if you have democratic rights, individual freedom, and equality, those rights will be there whether or not you, you say they are there. Because if you let people decide how they want to live, they will live the way they want to live. And they will create whatever group right they want to have in their own different areas. There are those in the United States. Different, different states have different um, approaches to different things. Um, whether it's, let's say, for example, uh, you go to Georgia, there's a whole different way of living in Georgia that's very different from California. And even within California, you go to Orange County, they have different values, maybe a little bit more conservative than San Francisco. And San Francisco edu people in San Francisco educate their children in a certain way. And in other areas, maybe in Idaho, they educate their children in a different way. So no one, there's no constitution in the US that says Idaho belongs to so-and-so and Idaho has to live this way or that way. People in Idaho get together every uh, number of years and decide how, who's, you know, uh, how they want to live. And that's the way it should be. Um, the idea of several states um, has been studied. And in fact, some scholars who have studied the US government system and the US constitution and the conflicts in the US over uh, since its inception in the uh, uh, 1780s, uh, they found out that if the US actually uh, was divided in three as opposed to the 50 states, the chance of it disintegrating uh, would have been higher. And what the studies have found is the more states you have, actually the more stable uh, a country can be. It's not, uh, it's not the case that if you have more states, the country will disintegrate. It actually would be more stable. So the reason for that is the more state you have, the less viable each individual state would be to become an independent country. And you mentioned earlier for example, the issue of Wolkait and Tigran. The whole concept that Wolkait is annexed, Wolkait belongs to this, Wolkait belongs to that, is a result of this constitution, right? Wolkait should be uh, administered in a way that people in that region wanna administer themselves. And no one should be dictating how Wolkait should operate. Even if it's under the Tigray region, they should have their own say they shouldn't be told how they live by TPLF, a party that rules Tigray. They should, 
they should have a local group. Already a one ethnic group, or if they're 50 50, maybe they will have a trade off. And so that, so that concept you're talking about, where they can, the local, the localities can decide, only works though if there are some minimum federal rights that they have to adhere to, right? If there, if that doesn't exist, then you know, when there's a majority people that are that feel like their ethnic Tigrayans are there, they dominate. When there is a majority yeah. people that feel like they're ethnic Amharas, they dominate. So in Walkite, for example, a lot of um, ethnic Amharas were saying they were not allowed to use to uh, study in Amharic, to go to school in Amharic, right? So even in Walkite itself, you can envision in a truly democratic, in a truly federal system within Walkite, one area educating their children in Tigrinya, another area educating their children in Amharic, another area educating their children in Oromo, depending on who's, you know, the majority in those little uh, enclaves. And why do you have an education system that's dictated from Magane, right? So um, this is why I was saying earlier, when you ask a person, are you free are you equal? Do you truly have democratic rights? You will not have a person answering yes to all three in any region of Ethiopia in the past 30 years. And that's because everything is dictated by one party. And you need to decentralize power. You need to empower local rule. You need to um, allow people to challenge the government whether it's a local government, a state government, or federal government that violates basic federal, federally guaranteed rights. And you need to have the court system that respond to that. So um, that is the kind of things that we need to be discussing as opposed to questions such as, is Article 39 good or bad? Should we get rid of ethnic federalism or should we go back to a unitary system? All these are distractions. They don't mean anything. They don't actually um, advance any, any individual's interest. The discussion should be what makes us more free, what makes us equal, what allows us to exercise our democratic right. Let's have that discussion. Right. And that, that goes into, you know, what language do you use to educate the people in your area? If everybody's using a different language, then that says if that's what people want then they're also agreeing to the idea that you can't really go to a lot of different places and work there because you're now getting educated in a different language than them so you know do you want to have that sort of limitation or separation or do you want to come into agreement on what is the working language and then you can just like we do here in this country have elective languages that you can take um, on top of that right so those are conversations that are just very tangible that you can actually have before i let you go you mentioned article 39 it was actually going to be my last question because it does get brought up a lot particularly early on in this war when the idea or some people believe that the idea of tplf doing uh, starting this war was to have an independent tigray but it looks like that was never their intention. It seemed like they wanted to take over the entire country uh, per their admission. Um, so Article 39 says every nation, nationality, and people in Ethiopia has an unconditional right to self-determination, including the right to secession. That whole self-determination uh, concept based on ethnicity has always been really odd to me, uh, but I haven't understood the process of right to secession. The Ethiopian constitution was enacted when I was in law school in 1994, I think. Um, and I wrote a law review article on Art Article 39, and back then that was published. So um, part of the problem with the um, whole concept of uh, secession is, first of all, you have to define, when you talk about self-determination, what you mean by self. And number two, once you define that, you have to find the land that attaches to that self. And then you have to figure out how that process can be accomplished. So um, it's actually, it sounds good to, as a right to have for some people from some leaders of an ethnic group, but in practicality, it's a very toxic 
uh, and unworkable uh, system, an unworkable right, uh, for that matter. Because um, first of all, you have right now 11 states in Ethiopia. Um, I, I doubt if any one of them, uh, me may find one or two, can be a viable state. And even within those states, you have various ethnic groups that would disagree with the definition of a self uh, that would uh, constitute um, a self under the meaning of the constitution. So for example, when you say self-determination, you are identifying one ethnic group or one group as a group that can exercise that determination. And if you take Oromo, for example, Oromo land, you have several other ethnic groups within that. And so how do you um, apportion the land? Who is going to uh, decide? And how do you actually practice this, exercise this right to self-determination? Uh, how do you uh, decide what land attaches to uh, that ethnic group and how that is decided? It's a very, very murky, uh, I don't think it's a practical, uh, workable um, framework to have that kind of uh, right exercise within a nation. Once you create a nation from various states, um, it's a united nation. So it's one state and dividing it is a very tricky process. And I think as a right, it may sound great, but in practice, even if you, when you talk about Tigray, for example, um, it's not a viable state. It cannot be a viable state. It's not advantageous for any Tigrayan to be in a, independent to the right state. So one thing I like, you know, a lot of people have different opinion about uh, the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. One thing I like hearing is economic plans. Yes. Hearing about plans for improving agricultural products, plans for improving the environment. Pla I mean, that's to me, the fact that Ethiopia planted millions and millions of trees will have more impact in the next decades than anything else we've done in the past 30 years. More than the roads that were built, more than any. I mean, the roads are very helpful. You have to have roads for economic growth, but the environmental impact of all the planting trees is going to be significant. Um, and wheat production, stuff like that. How do you in in increase that? We should talk about that. Why, why is it that every conversation has to be about war? Who's moving troops where? And, you know, we're spending so much energy and time over stuff that doesn't mean anything tomorrow, right? So we, the conversation has to be about things that advances the quality of life of people that advances the democratic rights and institutions, right, that support those democratic rights and, and improve the lives of people. It's, it's so little is said about that. And all of the oxygen is taken by the conflict and these, the pettiness that goes around where um, you know people are blaming each other about little things. Um, we spend a lot of time and energy on stuff that we should not be spending on. So I hope that economic plans, um, issues that matter to farmers, issues that matters to workers, how do you improve housing? How do you improve access to, you know, uh, clean water, energy, and 
those are the things that politicians should be talking about.